Brad? And we'll get started in just a second. Okay, I think we're ready to get underway. Welcome, hello everyone, thanks for joining us. My name is Robert, I'll be your host, but only for a few seconds, because I'm gonna turn things over to Sarah. Um, this is our Cooking with the First Ladies program. We're gonna be talking about Grace Coolidge today, and we're joined by Sarah Morgan. But before we officially begin with Sarah, just a few introductory items. We always welcome people to introduce themselves. So in the chat or the Q&A, if you wanna tell us your first name, where you're connecting from, and your favorite first lady, or first ladies, if you have more than one, um, feel free to do so. It's always fascinating to find out where people are joining us from and learn about people and what their interests are. And let's see, if you're watching on Zoom, we don't have time, unfortunately, to do a Zoom demonstration, but just real quick, usually there's only two things that people want assistance with knowing how to do. One is how to adjust the sound volume. So Sarah and I are speaking in our normal voices and we did a sound test earlier. Everything seems to be working fine. Uh, the audience will be in listen only mode except for Sarah and myself. So if you start cheering during our program, um, unfortunately we won't be able to hear you. If you want to adjust the screen display so that the video um, display or the slides that we're going to be showing takes up the full screen. If that's not currently happening on your device, look for something called view or view options, and you can check off the side by side mode. So basically, the sound and the video display are things that you control at your end through Zoom. If you have any questions or comments about our program, feel free to let us know in the chat or the Q&A. We will, um, Sarah will answer questions, but we'll hold off on asking those until the very end so that she can get through her demonstration. And let's see. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. For those of you not familiar with us, we're Washington, D.C. History and Culture. We're a nonprofit community organization. And in normal times before COVID, we bring people together to go do things like visit museums and go on walks of the city and whatnot. But one of the slight few advantages of COVID is we've started branching out into these live stream programs, which lets us do things with people throughout the world, including Sarah. Um, so we'll talk more about that in just a second. And for those of you who haven't met before, my name is Robert Kellerman. I'm the founder and the director of the Washington DC History and Culture Organization. And this week, we just so happen to be celebrating our sixth birthday uh, as an organization. So thanks for all of you who've been participating in our programs. And I was really excited uh, a couple months back the First Ladies Library in Ohio had a program that I somehow found out about um, called Cooking with the First Ladies. And I signed up for it and I was um, not feeling well at all that day. And I almost didn't attend. And at the last minute, I was like, well, you know, I'm really looking forward to this program. Let me go check it out. And um, even though I was not feeling good at all, I was so glad that I attended it because Sarah did such a great job. And I immediately, even before the program was over with, contacted her and said, you have to come do this presentation again for our group. And she graciously um, agreed to do so. So if you want to learn more about Sarah and the work that she does, I'll let her uh, talk to you about herself in just a minute. But you can follow her on Instagram. The name of her Instagram page is Cooking with the First Ladies. And with that, I'm going to end this PowerPoint. And I'll put this slide up a little bit later if you want to, if you need the Instagram um, handle, if you can't remember that or if you didn't get a chance to take a picture of it. So let me go ahead and close this out. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah. So, Sarah, it's all yours. Take it away. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, hey, y'all. My name is, um, again, Sarah Morgan. And so um, welcome to Cooking with the First Ladies and Grace Coolidge and the Roaring Twenties, which is what we'll be talking about today. Um, when I first started this project, I had absolutely no idea where it was going to go. Um, I actually found um, this cookbook, uh, the First Ladies Cookbook, um, at the thrift store. Um, so I got it for like a dollar. Um, and my husband actually convinced me to cook my way all the way through the first lady. So even though that particular copy of the book ended at Reagan, I just kept on going. And so I completed my project. Um, and again, I didn't know where it was gonna go. Um, so the National First Ladies Library um, contacted me. So I've been doing content for them, um, not just the live programs, but you can also 
um, go to their YouTube channel and see past pre-recorded videos, which I did see on the chat earlier. Some people said Eleanor Roosevelt and various different first ladies were their favorite. Um, so you might find something that you'll enjoy on there. Um, so um, I didn't really know all that much about the first ladies, even though I was a, um, a history major, I have a bachelor's in history, um, but I quickly discovered that they were really fascinating ladies. Um, and Grace Coolidge quickly became one of my favorites. Um, she had a very lively personality during an extremely roaring decade. Um, Grace Coolidge really reflected the cultural tone of the Roaring Twenties and was a first lady during a time of a booming economy and new inventions and technologies. Um, so today, um, I'm just gonna share a little bit about the very charismatic Grace Coolidge um, and also the 1920s. Um, and then I'll show you guys how to make um, a pineapple salad, which is way cooler than what it sounds, um, and icebox cookies, and also a coffee souffle. And we'll pause in the middle of my little brief presentation here about Grace Coolidge to make a Rob Roy. And you'll find out exactly why I chose that cocktail for Grace Coolidge here in just a minute. Um, and so like Robert said, I, I will stick around and answer some questions as best as I can um, at the end. So I'm going to pop over my computer and share a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation and a little bit of information about Grace and the 20s. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. I'm really also excited about this program because Grace Coolidge is one of my favorite first ladies. And um, a lot of times when people talk about first ladies, you know, they focus on Jacqueline Kennedy and Eleanor Roosevelt and whatnot. So it's great to learn about another um, first lady that's maybe not as well known, um, but it, she is one of my favorites. And so I think you're going to have her be one of your favorites as well when you hear Sarah talk about her a little bit more. I hope so too. Um, all right. So Grace has been described as glamorous, elegant, outgoing, and friendly, a loving wife and mother, dynamic, energetic, young, vibrant, witty with a loud laugh, and stylish. In many ways, she was the complete opposite of her husband, who was known as Silent Cow. Uh, and she balanced her husband's manner with her kind nature and vivaciousness. Uh, Grace was also very modest and once said, it has been my experience that those who are truly great are the most simple people at heart, the most considerate and understanding with a decided aversion about talking about themselves. Uh, she really followed this as well because she never spoke to reporters, uh, which also added to her mysterious quality. The 1920s were known most famously as the Roaring Twenties and the Jazz Age, and the Coolidge administration happened right alongside it. As many countries around the world were experiencing economic prosperity following the end of World War I, the decade brought about several new and exciting social and cultural trends. Jazz blossomed, Art Deco peaked, and the Charleston made its dancing debut. Uh, for women, knee-length skirts and dresses became acceptable, bobbed hair with the Marcel wave was the bee's knees, and they were smoking and drinking out of porcelain teacups in the speakeasies. These ladies who pioneered these trends were known as flappers, and Zelda Fitzgerald is often known as the first. Her husband, F. Scott Fitzgerald, described the 1920s in his book, The Great Gatsby, writing, the parties were bigger, the pace was faster, the shows were broader, the buildings were higher, the morals were looser, and the liquor was cheaper. Before the Golden Twenties, Grace Anna Goodhue was born in Vermont on January 3rd, 1879, and was an only child. She received an excellent education, including piano lessons and exposure to fine music. She also was very lively and a very friendly child who had an active social life, which reflected her personality as first lady and a hostess. Calvin Coolidge lived across the street after she graduated college, and she used to see him in his window, shaving with a derby hat on the back of his head and wearing his long underwear. Uh, there are varying accounts of exactly how they met, but regardless, uh, began writing letters in 1904 and were married in 1905. Grace's mother initially opposed uh, the timing of the wedding because she wanted the couple to wait until Grace had learned to bake bread. But Calvin actually responded saying, I can buy bread at the store. Grace Coolidge and Calvin both enjoyed poetry, and it was one of their first bonds. The first poem Grace granted permission to set to music was titled The Quest. It was played on the radio in 1930, and it goes, crossing the uplands of time, skirting the borders of night, scaling the face of the peak of dreams, we enter the regions of light, and hastening on with eager intent, arrive at the rainbow's end, 
and there uncover the pot of gold buried deep in the heart of a friend. They lived very simply at the beginning of their marriage and quickly had two sons. Grace once said of their early married life, what matters these trappings if love is strong and life is sweet? This changed very quickly when he was elected vice president alongside Warren Harding, where they moved to DC, lived at the Hotel Willard, and she quickly became the most popular woman in Washington. Grace was such an animal lover that she found a family of mice in their suite during their time living at the hotel, and instead of getting rid of them, she fed them crackers. She began presiding over the ladies of the Senate, and many said she had a natural charm, and although she was amused by all the social functions, she was very natural, uh, generally unimpressed, but in a fun and very casual way. Even when she became first lady, the social events and functions were just as Calvin, as well as herself wanted, unpretentious, but dignified. Uh, now Coco Chanel is credited with being the fashion icon of the 20s, including the shorter hairstyle and her little black dress was described by Vogue as Chanel's Ford, as it was as popular and available as Henry Ford's cars. Grace exemplified the flapper style with her sporty thin frame that worked perfectly with the straight low-waisted dresses, and she usually wore bright colors. Grace rode the Vogue wave of the time with her fashionable clothes and was even awarded a gold medal from the French government for furthering the modern fashion industry. Even though Cal was very frugal and also disliked progressiveness, especially with clothing and hairstyles, he did prevent her from wearing pants even on her daily hikes and walks or from bobbing her hair, but he did dress her in very expensive fashion. Uh, the era saw a boom in automobiles, telephones, motion pictures, radio, and household electricity, in addition to the significant changes in lifestyle and culture and shaped pop culture basically as we know it today. Grace Coolidge remembers uh, as a young girl getting steam heat as well as electricity installed in their home uh, which she said life was so much easier after that. The Coolidges also were the first couple to light the community Christmas tree by pushing a button to activate the light since electricity was relatively new even in the 20s. Uh, the media began to focus on celebrities, especially sports heroes and movie stars as the talkies took over the silent film. In fact, Grace was also the first first lady to speak in sound newsreels. Grace Coolidge also was a movie buff, and she invited several different vaudeville stars, screen actors, and recording artists to visit the White House. She also attended performances by Groucho Marx and purchased and used her own handheld moving picture camera. Newsreels also captured Grace at their vacation home in the Black Hills, South Dakota, wearing her sporty mountain gear. Uh, so now we're going to watch a short uh, newsreel clip of Grace with the Girl Scouts. In the middle 19th place, Grace Coolidge is first lady of the land and an honorary member of the scouts. Here on White House lawn, she ties Girl Scout cake and finds the scouting that sure pop the troopers out of cook up cookies. In 1925, at Broadway, Virginia, Mrs. Calvin Coolidge began a big cake. This time, we'll more advise us of eating scouts and troops. With her are founder Juliet Lowe and Mrs. Herbert Hoover. All three of them dressed in the latest Girl Scout fashion today. Uh, so in addition to actors, she also hosted Charles Lindbergh, the famous aviator who completed the first nonstop solo flight from New York to Paris in his plane, The Spirit of St. Louis, in June 1927 at the White House. Um, and that particular party became one of her most famous events. Unfortunately, even though Charles offered to take her on a flight around D.C., Calvin refused to allow her to do it because he thought it would be too much of an unnecessary public scene. Large baseball stadiums were built in major US cities in addition to palatial cinemas. Grace, a lifelong baseball fan who also taught the game to her sons while her husband was away in Boston due to his growing political career was known as the first lady of baseball. And she was a huge Red Sox fan. She once said, you might not give a hoot about baseball, but for me, it's my very life. As first lady, she attended the Washington Nationals home game, enjoyed a front row seat at the 1925 World Series, and was given a yearly season pass from the American League in a fitting and fancy gold trimmed purse. Grace would even tune into games on her personal crystal radio set with headphones, 
and would visit the White House Telegraph Room as well to keep updated on sports. In addition to baseball, she embraced the new technologies in general and listened to programs on her radio every morning. Uh, one of the most important historical events occurring during this time was Prohibition. Uh, Grace ironically named one of her dogs, Rob Roy, after a popular cocktail during the Prohibition years. Um, so I'm gonna pause my uh, PowerPoint here for just a second and hop back over here and show you guys how to make a Rob Roy cocktail. Okay, so first off, we're just gonna grab a little bit of ice in our cup. And uh, what you're gonna do is you are going to take two ounces of scotch whiskey. Um, you can use whatever scotch you want. Um, we usually use Johnny Walker Black Label. So two ounces of that. And then you're going to use one ounce of sweet vermouth. Two dashes of your choice of bitters or three, whatever you prefer. And then a squeeze of orange. And then you are going to stir this up for about 20 seconds. Or if you have a shaker, which I don't have a shaker, you can also um, shake it for about 20 seconds and go ahead and mix it with your ice. Um, during this step. And then you are just going to strain it over your ice. And then um, if you take uh, your orange and you slice off a little bit of a, of a peel, just a little bit off of it, and then you twist it like this, you can make a cute little orange twist. Um, and if you're not a fan of orange, um, with this cocktail, you can also actually use lemon as well. And so there you have it. Cheers, y'all, uh, to uh, Rob Roy. Just get Cheers, out. thank you. All right, and I'm just going to pop back over here. We're going to learn a little bit about Grace, a little bit more about Grace, and then we will start cooking. There we go. Um, okay, so uh, Rob Roy, her dog, um, pictured here, uh, also frequently appeared with Grace at public events and became the first dog to be a part of an official first family portrait in 1924 because the dog uh, was so much a part of the family. Uh, the first lady insisted on having him pose with her for her official White House portrait in 1924. When she debated wearing a red dress against the blue background, Hal, known for his dry sense of humor, suggested she could also achieve a red, white, and blue theme by wearing a white dress and dyeing the dog red. Uh, Calvin, an animal lover as well, once said, any man who does not like dogs and want them about does not deserve to be in the White House. The striking famous portrait was presented to her by her Pi Phi sisters. In addition to her two colleagues, the other one named Prudence Prim, the Coolidge's also had a literal zoo at the White House, which was known by the press as the Pennsylvania Avenue Zoo. The Coolidge's variety of animals included cats, dogs, and birds, one of which was her unnamed mockingbird she had to give up because it was actually illegal to own in DC. And she did not think it would be appropriate for the first lady to go to jail since the penalty was up to a month in prison and a $5 fine. Uh, now the most famous of these animals was a raccoon, which she named Rebecca. Uh, the raccoon had been sent from a couple in Mississippi as a gift to be eaten for Thanksgiving dinner, but neither Coolidge's wanted to eat it. So that year, the raccoon received a presidential pardon, just like the traditional turkey. Uh, Grace often showed off the raccoon and would walk it about on a leash. And in fact, the raccoon would often sleep on the president's lap in the evening. 
she was, uh, Rebecca the raccoon, I should say, was given a special uh, Christmas present one year, uh, which was a collar with a shiny plate that was engraved Rebecca Raccoon of the White House. However, the thoughts Rebecca had when Grace gave a raccoon for a coat to her son was never recorded. Uh, Rebecca caused a lot of mayhem in the White House and was known as a regular Houdini, escaping from cages, her harness, and also tearing up furniture and clothes. The chaos continued when they felt she was becoming lonely and decided to get her a mate, Reuben. In the end, however, both raccoons were given to the National Zoo at Rock Creek Park. These will most likely be the last raccoon pets at the White House because it is now supposedly illegal to own them in DC as well. Uh, the raccoon was not the first time people sent the Coolidge's animals that they had not necessarily asked for. They were also gifted a black haired bear, an African pygmy hippo, and a pair of lion cubs, which Calvin ironically named Tax, Redu Tax Reduction and Budget Bureau. Um, another important historical event was the passing of the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote in August of 1920. Even though Grace was in mourning after the sudden passing of her youngest son, Calvin Jr., she made a spectacle of completing her absentee ballot for reporters in 1924, voting in only the second presidential election in which women were eligible to vote. It also was one of her qualities that captivated her to the American public because she never let her grief get in the way of her duties and showed courage and strength even in a time of personal struggle. She eventually wrote the poem Open Door about the tragic death of her son, Calvin Jr. And on the fifth year anniversary of his death, it was published in Good Housekeeping Magazine, which she continued to submit poems to throughout her life. The 1920s was also the era of the new woman, when women began to challenge, um, as they would say, old hat norms, controlling their behavior, appearance, and cultural roles. And Grace embodied just about all of these fads with her love of baseball, her on-point style, and her embrace of pop culture, even despite her restrictions and regulations as first lady. She became a role model for young women because of her sense of fashion and independence. Although Calvin did not support her speaking vocally on politics, she used her quiet support of issues that were important to her by attending budget meetings, as well as Senate hearings to silently show her interests. Even with her lack of public speeches on these topics, her visible support on is issues such as women's suffrage and education, child welfare, and healthcare brought the national attention. Her most passionate issue, though, was for the deaf and disabled. Uh, for a time after her father was injured at work, she was sent to live with the Yale family and they introduced her to children with hearing impairments. After she graduated from the University of Vermont with her teaching degree, she was the, uh, actually the first first lady to graduate with a four year undergraduate degree. Um, she was also the founding member there of the Pi Beta Phi sorority um, and she continued to be a part of that her whole life. Uh, she and her sisters vowed to write round robin letters which future historians have used to see into their lives and interests. Uh, because she became a college educated first lady, her ideas were valued by many. After graduation, Grace decided to take lip reading classes and teach at the Clark School for the Deaf, where she taught lip reading classes rather than sign language. This passion continued throughout her life and into her time as first lady. She not only ended up raising $2 million for the school, which Calvin supported as well by asking his wealthy donors to contribute as a way to commemorate his time in Washington, but also invited the disabled and the hearing impaired to the White House. Uh, the most notable uh, was Helen Keller, which can be seen in silent newsreel footage using her hands to feel Grace's face and to read her lips. This brought a lot of public awareness to those with not only hearing disabilities, but also blindness and sight impairment. After Warren Harding's sudden death and on her first day as first lady, she said, quote, this was I, and yet not I, this was the wife of the president of the United States, and she took precedence over me. My personal likes and dislikes must be subordinated to the consideration of those which were required of her. Grace's time as first lady was just as roaring as the decade, um, and it very much changed and expanded the duties of future first ladies who would serve in the role. She participated in many public events, such as planting trees, hosting garden parties, accepting May Day baskets, and continuing the tradition started by Edith Wilson and Florence Harding of being honorary president of the Girl Scouts. She also had the honor of pressing the ceremonial button at the 1925 World's Fair. She was photographed often participating in these activities and was extremely popular with the public. Another highlight of her time as First Lady was in January of 1928, 
when she became only the third first lady to travel outside the United States during her incumbency when she went to Cuba. Grace also spent some of her tenure renovating the White House due to her interest in American history and antiques. She was, she was extremely interested in the antiques and used her visual skills to revamp the property. She was very disappointed in the lack of original antiques of former first ladies though, and went on a hunt to find some. Uh, she also created a crochet coverlet for the Lincoln bed and left it to become part of the permanent collection, which also started a tradition of first ladies leaving a memento for future residents. Uh, in regards to Lincoln, in fact, Grace is one of the first ladies uh, to have claimed to see Lincoln's ghost in what was his old office looking out the window. Uh, now, one of her lasting legacies was creating the idea to form a committee of antique and design experts to advise on the furnishings in the White House. And during her time, the green room was the first room in the White House to be fully furnished with mostly American antiques. The renovations included securing the roof and ceiling of the second story, as well as adding a beautiful sky parlor on the third floor, which many future families, uh, first families, uh, enjoyed uh, throughout their time at the White House. Uh, it was fitting, she wanted to add the parlor for more sunlight, uh, as her nickname given by the Secret Service was Sunshine because of her bright personality. Uh, after Calvin decided not to run for a second term in office, they purchased a home called The Beaches in Northampton. After Calvin's death in 1933, she continued to focus not only on raising money and awareness for the hearing impaired and the Clark School for the Deaf, but also the Red Cross and local charity work. In 1939, she raised money to bring Jewish refugee children to the United States from Germany and also for Dutch victims of the Nazis during World War II. She also loaned her home to the Waves and put her, most of her furniture up for auction in order to donate her money to the Red Cross. She was also extremely supportive of the United Nations after World War II and posed for a photo signing uh, her pledge in support of the organization. In addition to her charity work, she spent most of the time with her son and his family. Grace also took on new adventures. In 1934, she disguised herself with glasses and took one of her one and only trips back to Washington as a tourist and was able to go undetected. She also went on her first airplane ride and learned to drive a car, which of course Calvin had never supported either of those things. She ended up taking her first trip to Europe, which she uh, used her new driving abilities to take an auto tour with a friend through the country in 1936. She also began an autobiography after she realized there was a lack of recorded history of First Lady's lives in and out of the White House, which concluded with the end of her tenure in 1929. It was originally published in a series of two American Magazine articles, and then over 50 years later was published in full. She also submitted poems to Good Housekeeping Magazine and even started appearing in newsreels um, and talking in sound recordings. Uh, now, even though Grace had so many amazing attributes and lived such a literal roaring life, she considered herself hopeless in the kitchen. Uh, the recipes we're going to make today, um, although credited to her, most likely, especially with the coffee souffle, came from her housekeeper. Uh, so in addition to our recipes we're going to make, what were some of the other foods they considered to be the bee's knees back in the 20s? A few were flapjacks, codfish cakes, mushroom toast, and Hoover stew, which was named after President Hoover. Uh, this particular dish is just basic mac and cheese with sliced hot dogs. Uh, foods, especially Chinese as well as Italian that were seen as exotic during the 20s became popular. Prohibition also affected food trends during the 20s because many recipes started to leave out liquor from the recipes and replace it with alternatives such as vanilla extract. The 1920s also saw a spike in the sweet tooth, which translated to fruit cocktails pineapple upside down cake, jello molds, um, and they also really enjoyed um, little appetizers such as tea sandwiches, fancy salads such as Waldorf, um, and things of that nature. Uh, the 20s also started um, the kind of rise in people wanting to eat mostly vegetarian, um, and peanuts were promoted as healthy alternatives to animal meat. Culinary experimentation with pickles, olives, and relishes boomed. Although during the 20s, ingredients were still measured in pinches, dashes, and dips, uh, we will be using a little bit uh, more accurate uh, measurements today. Um, so uh, with that, uh, let's uh, start cooking. Excellent, thank you, Sarah. Okay, 
so unlike Grace Coolidge, I don't consider, I don't fully consider myself completely hopeless in the kitchen, but I did go to school for history. So the whole cooking thing is a little bit new to me, but um, I do my best and I have learned a lot from cooking through some of these recipes. Um, so uh, what we're gonna do first is um, I, I've got a little uh, double boiler here, which we'll need to make the coffee souffle. So I'm gonna get that started. Um, and so for our coffee souffle um, in a double boiler, uh, which I think that there's actually something that you can buy that is a double boiler, but I don't have one. So you can just use a pan with some water in it and a smaller pan fit inside. Um, and so for that, you're gonna start off your uh, double boiler, get the water heated up. You're gonna take um, one and a half cups of coffee. And Sarah, while you're doing that, just wanted to mention, so we'll record this program if someone wants to watch it again later, so you don't have to take notes. And then um, we, Sarah and I can email out the, the recipes afterwards. So um, if you're diligently taking notes, don't worry, we can, we can send you the recipe later. Totally, I will, I will, I will send you the recipes and you can yeah, yeah. take them out if you want to. Yeah, so you could, so you could just sit, sit and watch on this one, folks. Okay, um, so, and your coffee's gonna wanna be cold. Um, so you want it chilled. And then you're going to take um, half a cup of milk as well. And then it is uh, technically one tablespoon of gelatin, but if you get them uh, unflavored gelatin, but if you get them in the pack, it's just one pack. And so you'll put that in as well. Um, and then uh, it calls for two thirds cup of sugar, but for the beginning, you're only going to use um, half of that. So just one third of your total amount of sugar. And then um, once that gets heated up, and that's going to take just a minute, um, kind of takes a minute to get started, um, then we'll add in a couple of our other ingredients. Okay, so while we're waiting, um, we'll start on our icebox cookies. Um, so in our mixer over here, I already have um, a cup of butter, which is two sticks of butter. Um, and then we're going to add in um, two cups of brown sugar. And uh, we're going to mix that up until it's. Ah! <laughs> oh my gosh. See, I told you I'm not a cook. <laughs> I didn't lock it down. Okay. So you're going to want to mix your um, butter and sugar until it's all creamed up in there. And then, uh, which I've already done this, but this is um, just uh, three and a half cups of flour, a teaspoon of baking soda, and half a teaspoon of salt. And sift that all together. Then once your um, brown sugar and your butter is all creamed up together and kind of mixed, then you'll just add in your flour. This is a really easy cookie recipe too. So we'll slowly mix that up. Hopefully we won't have it fly off of the... I thought I was the only one that did that. <laughs> Sometimes I put it in and the flour just like shoots all over my stuff. Uh, that was probably a better outcome, honestly, on this one. Um, okay, and so then uh, you'll just want to get that all mixed up, and then you're going to add in uh, two eggs. We'll let that mix up for just a minute. And then uh, your last step will be uh, adding in a cup of chopped walnut. So really that's about it with the cookies. So we'll let that mix up here for just a second. Um, and I already have some pre-made dough so we can make that. Um, because with icebox cookies, as well as the coffee souffle, both of those you have to refrigerate um, overnight. So we'll mix that up so I'll let you see the dough. Um, but then what you're going to do after that, and this is the easiest way to do it, um, is you're going to take parchment paper and plastic wrap. And take your um, cookie dough and wrap it up into a log um, in parchment paper um, and then wrap that with your uh, plastic wrap and refrigerate that again overnight. Uh, then all you're gonna do is, um, I like to chop off the ends 
and kind of use those later. But um, icebox cookies, um, you're just going to take them and cut them into nice little round circles, just like that. And we're going to bake these on 375 for about 10 minutes. You can also cook them for about 12 minutes if you want them a little crunchier. Um, so after 10 minutes, you'll just kind of want to check them and see if they're the consistency um, that you that you want. And definitely make sure they're not too close together. I've done that before and they all mix together. So we're going to put these in. As soon as that gets preheated. <laughs> Um, and uh, so you'll have a lot of extra dough left over. So what you'll have here is it's kind of a crumbly dough. Probably want to mix it up just a little bit more than that. Um, so we'll keep that mixing. So we'll finish that later. Um, and then again, roll it into your uh, log and then we'll bake them and I will show you um, our finished product that we'll finish over here today. Uh, but this is essentially what you'll get is cute little circular cookies, icebox cookies. So our double boiler is still getting heated up. And basically what we're waiting on here is just for it to get going enough so that the gelatin um, and that sugar kind of mixes together before we're gonna add in uh, the egg and a little bit more of the sugar. So while we're waiting, uh, we're going to work on our pineapple salad, which is um, my absolute favorite part of Grace Coolidge's uh, meals, just because it's so unique. Um, and an interesting thing about pineapple is, is um, this really um, peculiar sweet treat, not this one, but um, actually pineapple started gaining popularity after a 1925 contest uh, was created by the Hawaiian Pineapple Company asking for submissions uh, for the best recipes, including pineapple, um, which was mostly pineapple upside down cake. So that was the winner. And that's kind of why pineapple upside down cake became so popular. Um, and also a coffee souffle is a little trivia about that in the 1920s. Again, I said they were replacing a lot of things with vanilla extract, but um, even during prohibition, uh, people were still adding brandy to their coffee cakes or coffee souffles, excuse me, and coffee cakes. Um, so for your pineapple um, salad is what they call this. Um, and again, I pre-did this. I'm not going to, you know, be slicing pineapple skin off um, on camera. That would might be disastrous as if that was. Um, so with your pineapple, um, you're just going to take it and you're going to you know, cut your pineapple directly in half, leaving the stems on. And then just uh, shave off your pineapple skin with your first pineapple. Now with your second pineapple, you're gonna do the, you know, the same thing, chop it, get the skin off, and then chop it into little kind of rectangular chunks. So then you're gonna take your rectangular chunks and position them on your pineapple here. We go. And then the next thing is, is you're going to take a baking bag or you can even just use a baggie and clip the end um, if you don't have any baking bags and fill this up with just regular uh, cream cheese. And then you're going to fill them in on the inside in between your pineapple slices. So this is super easy to make. Um, as you can see, this really doesn't take much skill at all. I'm sure Grace Coolidge was going to cook, much like myself, but she would be able to make a pineapple salad. Um, and so these are just really fun, I think, to make for little parties, um, things like that, you know, as a simple little dish that doesn't take much effort and kind of looks really pretty. And then you can make this and you can tell all your friends about Grace Coolidge and the 1920s. <laughs> or serve this at your next great Gatsby party. Well, we're a history group, so there's a lot of history nerds in this group. <laughs> Me too, of course. Probably, probably already doing that. 
that's actually what we were joking about. My, my cat's name is Gatsby. Um, and uh, he likes to be on camera. <laughs> um, so uh, we had to um, leave him upstairs with my daughter because he would be on the counter. Oh, he'd be making it be making a guest appearance, huh? Yes, he would um, definitely if he was down here be on camera. And then after we get this done, um, I am, while we wait for our coffee souffle, um, which I do have a finished product of that as well, because um, again, once we finish the actual um, mixture, you have to refrigerate it um, overnight. So we're gonna add a little bit more cream cheese, but while we're uh, waiting on our double boiler, after we finish this, I am gonna share one more really cool um, story from the 1920s. Here we go. Boiling, just make sure we don't boil it over. And we're preheated. So I'm going to throw our batch of cookies from today in here. Um, I'm going to share one of my favorite stories um, from uh, the ninth, early 1900s as well as into the 1920s. Um, and hopefully be able to demonstrate it. It is, uh, you know, middle of the afternoon here in Tennessee. So um, although it's a little cloudy, I'll turn off lights, we'll try to see it, but we'll try. So anyway, so after you get your cream cheese and you can add a little bit more cream cheese than that, um, you're just gonna take uh, cherries. You can also use candy cherries as well and just position them on your cream cheese like so. Uh, so while we're uh, doing this, I, I'll start the story just a little bit. But uh, the, uh, early 19, uh, the early 1900s um, really saw a lot of scientific advancements as well as discoveries. Um, and in 1898, Marie and Pierre Curie, uh, you know, two of the most prominent pioneers in researching radioactivity, uh, discovered the element radium. Uh, radium was particularly intriguing uh, because it glowed in the dark. And Marie actually noted uh, that, or she said, quote, like these gleamings uh, were suspended in the darkness and stirred us with all these new emotions and enchantments. Um, so around this time, um, an American inventor named William Hammer went to Paris um, and uh, obtained a sample of radium um, and salt crystals from the Curies. Um, uh, he uh, discovered that by mixing radium with glue and zinc sulfide, uh, he used uh, the radium corporation he, and he made this glow in the dark paint, which he called Undark. Um, so the US radium company um, set up um, a factory in New Jersey and Illinois to manufacture wristwatches with radium painted dials. Um, advertisements uh, for the product, which they called again, Undark, uh, boasted of how it kind of was made possible all by the magic of radium. Uh, so US radium would also receive government contracts during World War I to produce these watches as well as airplane instruments for the American soldiers. So let's start this really quick. Uh, but by the early 1900s, uh, when uh, the US radium companies opened up shop and throughout the roaring 20s, this radium frenzy really seized the world's imagination. So it was actually observed that radium could treat cancer. Uh, many people mistakenly thought it could be used to treat other diseases as well, um, including uh, old age even. Uh, so before long, radium was just rightly considered this miracle substance sold in pharmacies for all kinds of ailments. Uh, it was just in radium toothpaste, radium cosmetics, and even radium water. Uh, the factories assumed that it was safe uh, they even taught them how to paint tiny little numbers on the dials by licking their paintbrushes to a fine point. Uh, plus, radium, again, was supposed to be good for you. You could buy the water, the face cream, radium toothpaste, toothpaste and even uh, radium uh, brand creamery butter. Uh, so these products all didn't actually contain the expensive and precious element radium, uh, which was the most expensive substance on earth, uh, but it kind of gave them a healthful glow. So during World War I and the years thereafter, dozens of teenage girls and young women worked in radium dial factories, uh, painting these glow-in-the-dark numbers onto watches and airplane instruments for the soldiers. Uh, the paint got onto their hands, into their hair, and settled on their clothes, and so they glowed. 
they actually glow. Um, so we're going to pause right there for just a second. And at this point, um, our gelatin is pretty well mixed. So we're going to add in two egg yolks. As well as the remaining um, one third cup of our sugar. Um, and uh, what is this? <laughs> uh, your um, little bit of salt, excuse me. One fourth teaspoon of salt, excuse me. Okay, there we go. So now we're just going to let that cook a little bit. And again, we're just making sure it gets kind of thickened up. Um, and uh, the sugar and the salt and everything's all melted together. So I'll let that cook for a minute. So um, no safety precautions were taken basically. And the women were even encouraged to lick their brushes to keep the lip pointed and it you know, prevented the paint from drying. So by the end of the day, the women's found themselves uh, glowing actually just all over their clothes and their skin. Um, there was a Harvard psychologist who kind of investigated the factories and uh, he actually reported that the dust samples from the workrooms in the various locations and from the chairs were just all of it glowed if you put the room totally dark. Um, their hair, faces, arms, necks, the whole thing, dresses, even their corsets of these dial painters were luminous. Uh, one of the girls actually showed luminous spots on her legs and thighs. Uh, the back of another was almost completely glowing all the way down to her waist. Um, so all along, the company assured these women that their work was perfectly safe. Uh, so within a few years, however, dozens of women began to show signs of illness. Uh, their human body uh, mistakes radium, or our human bodies mistake radium uh, for calcium. Uh, so it filled their bones um, as calcium would, uh, er just destroying them from within. Uh, the victims had their bones break, teeth fall out, and their jaw bones were br brittle and degraded. Um, they broke at just the lightest touch, and this was known as radium necrosis. Uh, their hips would lock into place, uh, and their skin wouldn't heal, spines collapsed just these very brutal um, health concerns and deaths ultimately. Um, so by 1927, more than 50 of these women had actually died. Uh, so initial attempts uh, to compensate from US radium were not successful. Uh, so medical and legal costs for these women were huge. Um, so in order to kind of cover it up, uh, the uh, U.S. Radium basically tried to cover it up by saying these women had syphilis and all sorts of different things, which were kind of embarrassing diseases so that they wouldn't go out and kind of talk about these types of things. Um, so nevertheless, the story of, of this was the so-called radium girls, um, and that poisoning became just this huge national kind of situation. Um, eventually, one of the dial painters named Grace Fryer uh, filed a lawsuit along with four other women uh, with damages of over $250,000. Um, in a desperate need of money, they would eventually settle for $10,000 each and a $600 annual payment, although none of them would survive more than two years after the settlement. In fact, in 1934, Marie Curie actually passed away from exposure to radiation in her work of studying radium, um, as she was known to carry vials of it um, around in her lab coat pockets. Another legacy kind of lives on, uh, not only in their lawsuits and their story, uh, which were, of course, key, but it was uh, the beginning of U.S. workplace safety standards, um, but radium itself lives on. It's impossible to destroy, um, and the half-life is 1,600 years. So these radium girls are still glowing in their graves to this day. Uh, with this kind of cautionary tale in mind, though, scientists on the Manhattan Project learned to protect themselves from radiation. Uh, with the but while the development of Undark um, was extremely sad and catastrophic for the women who worked on it, it did disclose the dangers of radiation exposure. Um, this was true even prior to the creation of the Manhattan Project. Uh, so, um, of course, one of the main facilities uh, for the Manhattan Project was in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, um, and they tried to use these examples um, in order to create protective measures in uh, as Oak Ridge, uh, Tennessee was known as the secret city, um, as they extracted uranium specifically in order to assist in making the atomic bomb. Uh, the people at Oak Ridge uh, only knew of exactly what they were working on after the bomb was dropped on Japan um, on August 6, 1945. Um, so that's kind of the story of the Radium Girls, um, which if you're interested, there's a really great book called The Radium Girls um, by Kate Moore. Um, really fascinating. Um, and there's also a movie out as well, but I would more suggest the book. 
Um, so what I wanted to uh, share with you um, is Vaseline glass. Um, so uranium glass uh, or Vaseline glass contains trace amounts of uranium, uh, which gives it this uh, green kind of greenish yellow color, and it actually glows under a black light. Uh, now this type of glass became popular starting in the 1880s and remained that way all the way through the 1920s. But during World War II, uh, production completely ceased because the United States uh, confiscated all of the uranium for the Manhattan Project. Uh, so the name Vaseline glass um, also came from its supposed similar coloring to petroleum jelly. Uh, radium is massively more radioactive um, than uranium, uh, but it is a byproduct of uranium. So I'm going to hit the lights, and I hope that if I come close enough that you might be able to see this glowing in the dark, which I'm sure all of you being history people, for the most part, you probably have seen it before, but I just think it's so cool. And it's really sunny now. So I don't know, can y'all see this glowing at all? Oh yeah, uh-huh. Okay. And then I also have a marble that has Oh, hold it up just a little bit longer. Can you see it? Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Wait, here, let me get the other little black one. At all? Uh-huh. Yeah. Of course, the, the sun, the sunshine, which I'm very appreciative for, came out since. Uh, I'll show you guys that. But anyway, um, so if you ever go to an antique store or anything like that, um, you can take a black light and hunt yourself down some um, Vaseline glass, which I just absolutely love. Um, so our mixture over here for our coffee souffle is looking pretty good. Looks like we have just another minute or two on our cookies. All right, and our last two steps for our pineapple salad are um, you just take some strawberries and you just put them all around the edge. So like I said, this is a pretty simple one to make, but I think it looks really cool. Summer's coming up. Um, and then we're gonna make a little bit of a sauce. You can also put them along the back side too. Couple more here in the front. And there you have it. Pineapple salad. There you go. All right, bravo. <laughs> All right. And your final step for your pineapple salad is the sauce. And uh, last time I presented this, um, I had a question that I didn't really know the answer to, and I have since let's get our cookie. I have since learned the answer to it. All right, and here we go. We have our today made icebox cookie. Wow. All right, um, and that question is so for this recipe for this for this the sauce is you're going to take uh, two cups of powdered sugar, two whole eggs and one cup of heavy cream. Um, you can also put a little rum or sherry in there if you want, which I'm not doing that today. Um, and the question was, is that, is that safe to eat? Um, is it safe to eat raw eggs like this? And the answer is as long as they're pasteurized, supposedly. So I don't want anybody to take my advice, but um, hollandaise sauce actually is pretty much kind of made very similar um, in a way to this particular sauce. Um, that also kind of calls for the same type of situation. So you're just going to just mix all of that together. Let me get some powdered sugar on my hands and stir it up. And then what you're going to want to serve it along, if you want to be a little extra fancy, is a little gravy boat or something like that. And then you can just serve this on the side. So when people get their own little piece, they can top it with their own sauce. So you don't actually just pour it over or anything like that.
these are all really interesting recipes because these aren't the types of things you see at the store or <laughs> on restaurant menus or things like that, really unique items. Yes, and that's been one of the most fun things about, especially when I was cooking, because this recipe came, all these recipes came pretty much from this actual cookbook, um, especially the pineapple salad was in the book. Um, I, will, I, I will say that there's been a lot of recipes in here that you definitely wouldn't see at the store, some of which seemed like they were going to be gross, sort of like this peas pudding and things like that. You know, some of it seemed like, I don't know about that, that turned out to be really good. I mean, and if, if you go to my Instagram um, and look back on it, there's been some that's like, one of them was called a vegetable chartreuse, and um, it looks like it would be really gross, um, but it was actually pretty good. So if you go back and look at that, um, there's been some weird ones. You can also check out my my experience making beef steak and kidney pie, uh, which is a Martha Washington recipe. And um, I'm going to say I don't suggest that anyone ever, 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 ever try beef steak and kidney pie or <laughs> beef kidneys at all in general. So anyway, so here's your sauce to go along with your pineapple salad. Um, so we should be about good with our full-on mixture here. Let's get it stirred up just a little bit more, and then um, we'll have we have one last step to add to this mixture, and then I will show you what the finished product will look like. Since again, you have to refrigerate this overnight. So if you're planning to make Icebox cookies or coffee souffle, you're gonna to wanna to make it the day before. Uh, so your last step, and I whipped mine in advance because I only have one mixing bowl, um, is you're gonna whip your egg whites. Um, so you're gonna take three egg whites um, and then put them in your mixer with a little bit of vanilla and then just whip them on high speed until they're completely whipped. It's sort of like making a meringue. Uh, then we're gonna take this mixture off of our double boiler. And you're just gonna slowly stir in your whipped egg whites, or as they say, fold them in. I don't, I'm sort of like the show on TV, if anybody's seen it, Ships Creek, where they say to fold in the cheese, but they don't really know what that means. Um, I don't know what it means either, but <laughs> uh, it seems to work out. So you're just gonna fold them in until they're all mixed up and it looks, in my opinion, pretty gross. Um, but actually, um, the whole coffee souffle thing turns out really good. All right, I'm gonna Hold them into the bowl here just a little bit because we're running out of some room. There we go. I'm sure some of you out there are probably way better actual cook cooks than me. Um, and you <laughs> might be like, oh my gosh, what is she doing? Um, but these are the historical recipes. We'll go with that. <laughs> All right, so you'll kind of get this like super funky kind of mixture once you get it all mixed up in there. And then in your pretty greasy mold, pretty greasy mold of any kind, you're just gonna pour in your coffee souffle and smooth it out on top. And then you're gonna refrigerate this overnight. And then what you'll get, and I use a different mold for my first one. Is your coffee souffle. Um, so for mine, um, these are chocolate covered coffee beans. I put them around the edge. Um, and then uh, you can top this off with chocolate shavings. Put a little bit of whipped cream and then a little bit more chocolate shaving. And so 
there you have your coffee souffle. Wow. So, so today we have our coffee souffle, our pineapple salad, our rod roy, and our icebox cookies. Awesome. <laughs> That's all I have for you. <laughs> awesome. That was fabulous. Thank you very much, Sarah. That it's really fascinating. <laughs> So, um, so quite a few questions came in. Um, so what is your, like, what does your family think of all this? Um, they must be, do you, like, do you cook this stuff like at Thanksgiving and stuff? Or do you like test it out with your husband and your I family do. Actually, members? It was my husband who really, when I got the cookbook, because I just got it because, you know, when I was going through books, I was like, oh, this is so cool. This is, you know, and I just sort of put it with one of my mini books on my bookshelf. And um, he was kind of looking at him one day and he just said, oh, do you know what you should do? You should do like that Julia, Julia movie and you, should like, <laughs> you know, hook your way through this heavy stuff on and, and, you know, of course, you know, he, he likes to eat, you know, and stuff. So um, I was like, you know what? Okay. And that's why the very first recipe that I did was Martha Washington's beef steak and kidney pie. And, uh, you know, even though he's a liver and onion fan, um, I'm not, I didn't think I would like it. He was kind of excited. And, uh, you know, that was the very first recipe and none of us liked it, you know, and it was like, you know, and so I thought, well, this, is, this isn't going to be a very fun project, but um, yes, actually, um, all of the recipes that I have made since the beginning, um, not only have I tried, my husband has tried, and then I have one daughter who um, is just, she's 13 now, but, um, you know, she was 11 when I started, and so she is graciously tried every single one, including the beef steak and kidney pie, all the way through has actually taken one bite of all of them. So um, even some of them that look kind of gross, she's taken a bite of it. And sometimes <laughs> she's been like, you know what, that's pretty good. So yeah. And I did have one Thanksgiving, um, not this past Thanksgiving, but Thanksgiving before um, that I cooked all Thanksgiving sort of style dishes. Um, first ladies dishes. I chose uh -huh. pick those from what I've done so far. And serve that so if the if the martha washington one you guys didn't like i guess i'm imagining the second dish you cooked was um it turned turned the momentum around it did um it was, and i but i also cooked a second recipe for martha washington and now i can't which i've cooked for her again since i finished the project project which was uh, martha washington's great white cake which is really good as well um but right after i did that one i cooked one that was kind of more of a dessert too so that was like okay and then following that, I, I don't know that there's one that's been necessarily that bad. Yeah, can you talk about that cake? Because I remember seeing it at Mount Vernon, this big giant white cake. Um, it has like a zillion eggs in it. Yeah, it does. Um, yeah, she actually, she served that at um, um, a lot of different um, kind of big events. But one of the ones, uh, events that, um, she served that out at mostly, I believe, was the Twelfth Night celebrations mm. after uh, the Christmas holidays. Um, so I think that was one of her big things um, that she served then. And I want to say um, that quite possibly that was also one that they made, um, especially for people traveling. I might be mixing that up with another dish, but um, she definitely, one of the main holidays that she would make that and serve that for was the 12th night. Okay, no problem. And then there were a lot of questions. So how do you serve the pineapple cake? Do you just leave it out and people um, get it with forks and stuff and help themselves that way? Yeah, you can definitely just do that. Yeah, they can just, and, and you, could, you could also, with your pineapple chunks, if you wanted to, you could cut these a little bit smaller pieces so that it's not oh, just I see. a big mm -hmm. long chunk. You could do that if you wanted to. Um, but yeah, you could um, just put the like little plates out and little, you know, toothpicks or little serving forks and people just kind of serve themselves. And as you get down to the bottom layer of pineapple, you could probably just cut that up too. So um, <laughs> you could also stack it up a little higher if you were going to uh -huh. have a lot of people, but um, that would be my suggestion. Okay. And then what about not necessarily related to Grace Coolidge, but some of the other first ladies, what were some of the other um, dishes that you made that either were your personal favorites or your family that tried it like the best? Um, let's In particular, see. Well, things stand out? 
Yes. Um, okay, so we live out right outside of Nashville, uh, a little south of Nashville, Tennessee. And so, of course, um, Andrew Jackson, um, his home is in the Hermitage right outside of Nashville as well. So I've been there several times. And when I was doing the project, when I got around to Rachel Jackson, I went up, you know, I'd been there multiple times, and I went to visit, and I just happened to be talking to one of the ladies, and I just mentioned what I was doing. And so she said, the Jacksons had this really awesome grape salad recipe. And she sort of kind of briefly shared it. And I found a, one that was sort of attributed to him, but I would say that grape salad was one of my favorite. It was oh, yeah. really, mm. really good. Um, a second one um, would be- what, um, what is it like? A fr Is it like a fruit salad? Like what, yeah. what exactly is grape like salad? A, like a creamy um, chopped up grapes with, um, I haven't made it in a really long time. I, uh, but yeah, just grapes. And it's just like a really creamy cold fruit salad basically. Okay. Um, and, and then my, um, one of my second ones, uh, would have to be, uh, Jackie Kennedy, uh, with her, uh, beef stroganoff. Mm -hmm. Um, that's been one that has been family requested to make again and again. When are you going to make oh, yeah. beef stroganoff again? Beef stroganoff. Yeah. So hers was, um, really, really good as well. Um, was that a recipe of herself? Cause you know, Jackie Kennedy is very highly regarded, but I don't really hear people talk about her and cooking usually in the same conversation yeah no and she she's what she wasn't but um it's even like um recently i uh did a, a video for waffle day and uh the kennedy's had a waffle recipe actually oh, that okay. was passed out by jackie as well as um john in different publications and it did come from their family they're just not really sure exactly where but so yeah jackie wasn't a big cook but of course she was a huge fan of french foods um, and they did have several family recipes. Um, so um, the beef stroganoff that's attributed to her in any sort of way is really good. I don't think, like you said, I don't think she was standing around making it. <laughs> that's okay. No, not a problem. Because I know sometimes when there's fresh, maybe in your family too, when there's recipes, um, you know, they either come from the husband's family or the wife's family and they kind of get incorporated and passed down to the children and et cetera, et cetera. Um, what about what, what particular first ladies would you say were the best um, cooks overall? Any particular ones stand out as most talented or spent the most time doing it? Because the more modern ones, I would imagine they're, they're busy doing first lady stuff all day. They don't have time to be cooking, you know, they're career women. Yeah, um, that's a hard one. I would have to say one of them, and I don't know that it's necessarily uh, like off the top of my head with who was best at cooking, because again, mo a lot of them really didn't cook in regards to when they were first. Like, a lot of them really didn't. Um, Rosalind Carter um, actually, though, did kind of talk a lot with the White House staff um, kind of about their favorite family foods and recipes and things. So she was kind of involved in kind of planning it, not necessarily probably cooking it. Um, I would also have to say though, um, oh, I don't want to say that it's the wrong first lady. She made bread. Why am I, I'm blanking on it. Um, it's not Lucy Hayes. I don't know who that is either. Oh, here, I'll, I'll look at it. Well, anyway, I'll tell you the story and then I'll tell you who it is. But essentially, and I don't know why I'm blanking on it. She, oh, it's okay. um, had to bake bread and this was before um she was first lady but she had to bake all this bread all the time and she hated it and she just couldn't stand it and didn't want to do it but she told herself she said you know what if i'm if i'm gonna do it um then i'm gonna make the best bread i've ever made and she continued she just made the best bread she ever made like all the time so she just put all of her energy into doing it well and and whatnot instead of complaining about it um so i just i really liked that um aspect of her and I just that was a like, that was oh, a funny story about grace coolidge's lucretia husband garfield. oh lucretia okay lucretia garfield. from ohio now yeah. that book can you hold up that book again is that still in print or is that uh you have to just get used copy um i'm First not ladies sure. cookbook I I think that they um, have made more recent copies of it. Like I said, this one only goes through Reagan. Okay. Um, and as you can see, it was, it's pretty beat up for me just using it, but it was pretty beat up when I got it. <laughs> um, I did um, at a historic site in the area, um, not this past, you know, pre-COVID, um, I did a first ladies event and I had um, a lady who 
came and had a copy of the First Lady's Cookbook that looked, it was the same author, same font, same thing, but it was blue and it was um, a little more recent. Um, so I think you could probably at least find a used copy okay. somewhere online. Okay, that's awesome. And then what is like, what are your future projects? Like, so you've gone through and done all these different recipes. What are you hoping to do like in the next uh, year or so? Ooh, well, I have out? no idea. Things keep, <laughs> things keep coming. Um, uh, I'm going to be um, on April 26th for the National First Ladies Library. Um, I'm going to be doing um, Rosalind Carter and the Rock in 70s. Um, so pretty much same style as Grace Coolidge, but it's going to be about her and focus on the 70s and kind of Jimmy, Jimmy Carter being kind of that rock and roll president and that whole thing. Um, and then and what day will that what day will that be? Um, April 26th. OK, so if you're listening, I'll send that out as well. The date, if you want to sign up um, for that, with, it's through the National First Ladies Library, which is an awesome organization. Yes, and it's, it's, a, it's a free event as well. And if you can't attend it, they um, they do do it on Facebook Live as well, and they do post it later. Okay, terrific. Um, as well, um, and then um, right after that, um, I'll be doing um, in May, beginning of May, I believe it's May fourth. I'm going to be teaching, which again, most of you have already attended, but if somebody else is interested, and it's very limited, I think this class size is only for eight. But um, Grace Coolidge again for the uh, Cambridge Center for Adult Education. Okay. Um, so those are two of the main things. Beyond that, I'll have several videos next month, uh, just pre-recorded videos that they'll be posting on the National First Ladies Library social media. Um, I can't exactly off the top of my head remember what I chose. Oh, Cinco de Mayo, one of them would be Cinco de Mayo based and be sharing okay. some, uh, like Barbara Bush and Laura Bush and Hillary Clinton, uh, as well as some guacamole recipes and their enchiladas and things. And then I don't have a date set for it yet. They haven't exactly told me, but in July, I'll be doing um, the same program style for Jackie Kennedy um, as well for the NFLL. And um, in October, um, I haven't decided I'll either be doing Eleanor Roosevelt or Dolly Madison. So again, awesome. same style, same thing. So that that's really what I have coming up. Um, awesome. <laughs> In regards to this stuff. <laughs> no, that's really awesome. It's just such a unique uh, idea and interesting way to present history. And it's a really entertaining way to, I mean, learn about Grace Coolidge and cooking and food and stuff. Um, now, you did one mention one thing you talk about, like in the 1920s, fruit was getting popular as far as dishes. And you know, was there any particular reason that caused that? Was it transportation or? Anything like that? No, no I'm really coming? sorry. Oh, okay. Off the top of my head, um, it could quite possibly be that. Um, and I also think uh, with their just like with sweets and things becoming mm -hmm. popular and um, sort of things like that. I think and and probably more probably like like more accessibility to it for more people. Um, I would say that probably sounds right to me, but I don't know off the top of my head. <laughs> right. Okay. No, that's okay. No, that makes perfect sense. So awesome. Okay. Well, like I said, um, thanks so much everyone for joining us today. I'll email out the recipe information and then the date for the other program. It's hosted um, by Sarah and the National First Ladies Library, excellent organization. And um, this was really fabulous. I just bravo appreciate you were getting all kinds of kudos and whatnot in the comments, um, people clapping and applauding uh, electronically well, and digitally. Well, <laughs> so, thank you all so much for having me, uh, DC Culture and Robert. Thank you so much. And and uh, I just enjoyed doing it and, and thank you. And I do hope everybody enjoyed it. and. Um, Thank y'all so much for tuning in. I super duper appreciate it. So, yeah, no, it was um, great. I, I this is the kind of, uh, 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 as the flappers would say, uh, you know, didn't think it was totally bonus balonus. So, <laughs> uh, it what we thought it was the cat's meow. So. <laughs> it was the cat's meow for sure. Definitely. Excellent. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Sarah. And thanks everyone else for joining us. Have a great rest of your weekend. And, um, I don't know about all of you guys, but I'm now really hungry. So I gotta go find something to eat for lunch. But I don't... <laughs> so thanks everyone. Take care. Thanks, Sarah. That was excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye, take care, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.